for those of you who don't know us, we're the Porters. I'm Serena Porter, my husband Neil, and our two busy boys, John and Glenn. And we want to introduce you to the newest member of our family, Dahlia Joy. She was born on the 28th of October, and we named her Dahlia Joy. Dahlia means blessing from heaven or dew from heaven. And we believe she's going to be a fresh blessing to the people she meets. And I'm reading today from um, Luke 11, 5 to 13, from the New International Version. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me your three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The doors are already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Let's just pray for the preacher now, for Ian. Lord Jesus, thank you for the word that you've given Ian today, Lord. I pray that um, that where you've prepared him uh, in this week for the, for this talk, Lord, that he, that he had be prepared. And Lord Jesus, that I, pr I pray that the Holy Spirit would um, inspire him in in new ways, and that he would be listened to the Holy Spirit um, that if it prompts him in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Neil and Serena. It's great, isn't it, that we can join in wherever we are in the world. Neil and Serena actually went to South Africa for uh, Christmas. They went for three or four weeks initially to begin with. Um, and then because of the COVID situation, not able to get a flight back. So at the moment, they're due to come back around Easter. Um, they've had about three flights cancelled so far, but still great that they can be part of our community. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to have you with us. Apparently, we're having a few issues earlier on YouTube with the uh, video visuals being out of sync with the sound. Fortunately, our amazing tech team have got that sorted. That was a big worry for me because I was worried that my hands were going to be out of sync with my voice. But now you can get the full Ian experience all together. So that is a great relief. So today we're kicking off a brand new series called the Prayer Series. I want to... Uh, as Stuart did, uh, honour uh, Frida Ward and her legacy. Frida was a real woman of prayer, and so she would have loved that we were uh, kicking off a prayer series. Um, and uh, we are hoping that uh, we're going to be able to hold Frida's uh, funeral service from here, from Woodford, which means we're going to be able to live stream it to everyone. It also means that it will be available on demand afterwards. So we'll be able to honour Frida fully and well uh, through this uh, season. So today we're kicking off this new series that we've called The Prayer Series. Um, and as Stuart said, we're basing it on uh, the Lord's Prayer. Um, as a part of that, we, uh, again, as Stuart mentioned earlier, we want to do 40 days of prayer and prayer of blessing our local community. If you remember the word that God gave us for this year is from Isaiah chapter 42 and it's verses 5 and 6. I just want to encourage you to keep yourself rooted in that word. And there were three things in particular that we felt that the Lord was speaking to us for this year. Number one, it was to remember the bigness of God. Remember the wow of God. So many uh, crazy things going on in the world around us, so many challenging things, which is why we need to root ourselves in the goodness of God and in the bigness of God. So we want to keep a big vision of the truth of who God is in front of us all time. Secondly, we want to be really well connected to one another. The third thing that we want to do is we want to be lighthouses to our community. We want to be the hope bringers. And I know this last year has been quite incredible in terms of the level of emotional challenge that I think probably every one of us has uh, faced in one degree or another. Do you know, 
as I think about that, I think how amazing uh, it is that we've been able to uh, face that challenge together as a church community. At the same time as that, I think, how on earth are other people coping? And I think the reality is the wider community probably isn't coping. I was on a, a call the other week with some voluntary agencies uh, in the whole of uh, Epping Forest district. And uh, it was quite um, shocking, actually, just the level of need and demand on support services at the moment and people not really knowing how to be able to meet the measure of need. And we know that that's going to continue for quite some time. Do you know, if ever there was a time for us to be good news for our community, it's now. If ever there was a time for us to be praying blessing on our community, it's now. And so in two weeks' time, or just uh, uh, under, on the 17th of February, we're going to begin 40 days of praying for our local community. And we want to encourage every one of us, you know, we can go out for daily exercise. Let's couple our daily exercise with prayer walks where we pray God's hand and we pray God's blessing on the local community. We're going to do that from the 17th of February right the way up to Easter. And so even now you might, might want to be thinking, you know, what are the prayer walks that I'm going to do? If, if at some point during that time, maybe we'll be able to walk with, uh, with at least one person because we can do that at the moment, uh, but maybe even more. If we can do that, let's together be praying God's love and God's blessing into our local community. If I can say one other thing about where we're heading into this season as a church as well. We know at the moment we're not able to gather. If you're a fan of uh, reading the latest regulations, um, you'll know that uh, technically, legally, um, the, there is permission for churches to gather in this season. But actually the Mayor of London and also Essex um, as, a, as a district, as, as a county, issued a directive to all the churches and asked that we would close our doors over this season. So we don't feel able to restart any form of gathering until we're given permission to be able to do that. When we are given permission to be able to gather, as Restore, we want to begin to open up uh, premises where we're able to, because I know so many of us have missed being able to be church community. I guess when we can gather, we just need to uh, be respectful of the fact that we're probably still going to have to socially distance. We probably still won't be able to sing, so it will be a different form of gathering. But I want to reassure you, as soon as we are able, we will begin the process of heading towards opportunities to gather. What we sense God is saying, though, is that we should start those gatherings locally. So we're looking at a, at a greater number, a wider number of venues to create smaller gatherings. But again, it's because God's heart is that we're, uh, we're lighthouses to our local community. God's heart is that we're sharing uh, light with the local community. And so we want to create more uh, gathering points where, as a part of that gathering, we can have an outward focus and be thinking, what can we pray over this local community? What can, how can we be a blessing to this local community because we know ultimately that's what God's called us to. So we'll keep you posted on that. Obviously, we're not able to give a timetable on it at the moment because restrictions are changing as we go and we're having to live week by week. But I just want to re reassure you that is the kind of direction that we're heading in. So today we're beginning looking at the prayer series and we're taking it from Luke's gospel and Luke chapter 11, which is where Luke uh, recounts the Lord's prayer. And it's really interesting the context to it there because Jesus goes off to pray. His disciples then see him when he comes back. And uh, one of his disciples says, Lord, will you teach us to pray like you pray? And they'd obviously noticed that prayer was something that made a change in Jesus that then seemed to be the uh, thing that was then causing the power of God to be able to flow out of Jesus's life. And it's interesting that uh, there's no other thing, there's no other recorded incident when the disciples asked Jesus to teach them anything. So they didn't say, Lord, teach us to do the miracles that you're doing, or Lord, teach us to have the kind of wisdom that you, that you bring. They said, Lord, teach us how to pray as you pray. And something clearly happened to Jesus when he prayed with his father. 
And prayer is our lifeblood. It's the place that we encounter the presence of God. And it's the place where we find his strength. It's the place where we find his help. And it's the place where as we encounter his spirit, then so he transforms us. I don't know what it looked like when Jesus returned from prayer. Sometimes in my mind, I wonder if it looks a, looked a little bit like Moses in the Old Testament when he used to go up the Mount, uh, of, uh, uh, Mount Sinai and used to meet with God. But when he came down, his face would literally glow with the presence of God and it seems to be that there was something about when Jesus met with his father he came back differently and the disciples said wow I want that and so in Luke chapter 11 at the beginning of that uh, the disciples say to Jesus Lord will you teach us to pray like you pray and then Jesus gives them the Lord's prayer and not only does he give them the Lord's Prayer, but then he gives them a block of teaching. And what, it's, what it seems to be happening is he gives them a pattern of how to pray. And uh, when we talk about a pattern of how to pray, um, I don't think he gives them a prayer to recite over and over again. Although it's good to remember the Lord's Prayer, it's good to commit verses of scripture to memory. I think he wasn't just saying, let's pray these six lines and then your prayer life is done. I think what he was saying is, here are six priorities. Here are six keys that when we commune with God, here are six areas to focus on. And he follows the Lord's Prayer in, in Luke with then two two chapters of teaching that I think expand on those six things. And so through this prayer series, we're going to take those six items that are listed in the Lord's Prayer, and we're going to look at the expansion of them and teach through them. So to uh, detail them, we're going to look this week at coming to Father, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, may your name be set apart, may we really understand who you are. Then next week, Jody's going to be looking at praying the kingdom in, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The next week, we're going to be looking at give us this day, our daily bread. Trina Simpson's going to be doing that. The next week, we're going to be looking at forgive us our sins, having a purity of heart. Stuart will be back and teaching on that one. The next week, we're going to look at uh, forgiving those who have hurt us, who have uh, forgive those who've trespassed against us. And uh, Jennifer Isacor is going to be uh, sharing with us that week. And then... Uh, uh, the last week we're going to be looking at resisting temptation. Um, so being able to walk in the ways of God. And then after we finish those six weeks, we're going to have a seventh week, which is going to be a week of celebration and giving thanks to God. And uh, we may well do a special gift offering that week, a, a love gift offering to Jesus and a way of saying thank you and also pointing the way towards the future. And we'll give more information about that. But each week we're going to teach through a different element of the, of the Lord's Prayer. And as I say, I believe that what Jesus was saying was he was opening out his priorities that he wants us to focus on when we pray. You know, the reality is it's so easy when we pray, isn't it, to make it all about ourselves. It's so easy to think, oh, this is the thing I'm worried about. This is the thing that I need. And it all becomes about us. Now, it's not that God isn't um, interested in what's going on in our lives. It's not that God doesn't want to help us in them. But God has some priorities of his own that he wants us to connect with. And the Lord's Prayer, I think, is about picking up some of those priorities. We're going to start this week with a, a very beginning bit. Can I say as well, uh, we're encouraging as many people as possible to take up our offer of a free subscription to Right Now Media. If you've not yet done that, you can do that for, through the Restore link tree. Um, hopefully that'll appear um, for, on the chat host uh, stream today. On Right Now Media, there's a great resource called the Prayer Course. And it's been put together by Pete Gregg and the 24-7 uh, Prayer Movement, which is an amazing movement to connect to. And uh, they do a course called the Prayer Course, which again is based on the Lord's Prayer. So if you want to track something alongside uh, this teaching series, or if you want something extra to do as house group, then why don't you watch the Prayer uh, Course and go through that. Again, it'll reinforce some of the teaching that we're doing here. So our starting point today is the very beginning of the Lord's Prayer. And Jesus says to his disciples, he says, when you pray, pray this, pray, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your name be set apart. But he starts with a simple phrase, but actually if we really get hold of it, a revolutionary phrase. He says, our Father. 
Now, if you put this into context, if uh, I don't know how much you read the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament. I think there's so many nuggets in the Old Testament that we then see developed in the New Testament. I think some people get scared by the Old Testament because of the picture of God that we so easily pick up from the Old Testament. And God in the Old Testament is portrayed much more as, as a distant God, quite often, as a powerful God, and, uh, and sometimes a judgmental kind of God. And, and there seems to be more emphasis on the fearing of God. Now, if you dig under the surface, God also in the Old Testament is portrayed as other things. God is portrayed as a, as a shepherd, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. God is also portrayed in the Old Testament as a father. In Exodus chapter 4, when God calls Moses, he talks about the fact that Israel will be his son. And uh, when he speaks about leading them through the wilderness, he says, I led you through the wilderness like a, like a father carries a son. And so there is in the Old Testament the picture of God being our father. But when we read through the Old Testament, it isn't, of, it isn't normally the primary thing that we take away. When we come to the New Testament, Jesus turns the tables on that. Jesus changes something in terms of our understanding of who God is and our ability to approach God. Why? Because Jesus, with his sacrifice on the cross, will break the power of sin and make God accessible and mean that we can come close to our Heavenly Father. And in John's Gospel alone, Jesus refers to God 107 times as Father. And another 30 times, he talks about being the Son of God. Now, you can look at that and you can think, well, that obviously is true of Jesus because we know that he was God's Son. But what about us? Do we have the same status? Well, it's interesting that when Jesus uh, teaches the disciples to pray, he says you can step into the same love relationship with God as Father as I know. And so he says when you start to pray, pray our Father. And you see, how we approach God will be totally impacted by the vision that we have of what God is like. So if we see God as a ruthless disciplinarian, we will be fearful and pull back. But if we know that God's heart is for us, I love that picture of a, of, of a uh, loving father and a son running towards him. If we understand that that is how our Heavenly Father feels about us, it actually changes everything about how we pray. And you see in Luke chapter 11, after Jesus has given the Lord's Prayer, the next few verses expand on what it means to know God as a father. And Jesus tells two stories. He actually tells a story about a friend and a story about a father. But just reflect on that for a moment. Both times, the first two glimpses that Jesus is giving us about how to approach God, he's saying, think of God first as a friend and then as a father. Do you know, God this morning is your friend. In fact, he's more than your friend. It says, it says in uh, Proverbs that God sticks with us closer even than our brother. Do you know, Jesus wants to be your best friend. The Holy Spirit wants to lead you into a place of friendship, intimacy with God. And so one picture is about a friend, but the other picture goes even further, and it's about a good father. And let me say the emphasis is on a good father. And in the story of a friend, Jesus tells the story about a guy, and he has some old friends turn up at midnight, so in the middle of the night. And uh, when they turn up, uh, they've come on a long journey, they want some food, but he doesn't have any, any food. They've dropped in spontaneously at midnight. And so the guy doesn't know what to do. So he thinks, ah, I'll go to one of my friends because they'll be willing to get up for me, even though it's midnight. So he goes and he knocks on their doors and he said, I've got an unexpected visitor. Um, I need some food. Can I borrow three loaves of bread? Now, actually, the friend was a bit grumpy. 
So he was a grumpy midnight friend. And he's kind of like, you're waking up the neighbourhood. You're going to wake up the kids. What are you doing? But Jesus goes on and says, even though he's grumpy, because you're bold enough to ask, and you know he's a friend, he'll still give you what you want. And he comes up with this phrase, which I love. He says in verses 9 and 10 of Luke 11, So I say to you, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Why? Because God is good. Why? Because God is for us. And so actually, we don't have to cower away from God. We don't have to put on our Sunday best to feel like we're good enough to come into the presence of God. Actually, God is for us and he loves us and his heart is going out to us so we can be confident to come to him. We can be confident to open up our hearts. We can be confident to draw close. And when I looked at those verses, it reminded me of the famous verses in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, which say this. They say, let us then approach God's throne of grace. Notice that, God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I said at the beginning, this has been quite some season, hasn't it? Isn't it such good news that even in the toughest season, we can approach someone whose heart is for us and we can know his grace providing us with help in our time of need. And so Jesus, when he's explaining to the disciples, you have access to a God who's for you. He starts with a friend, but then he goes on and he takes it even further. And he says, you know, God's even better than that. He's a good father. And he tells um, two stories, or gives two illustrations of it. He says, you, even though you're evil, if your son comes to you and he asks for a fish, you won't give him a snake. And if your son comes to you and he asks for a, an egg, you won't give him a scorpion because you know how to give good gifts to your children. And he says, if, if broken mankind, if fallen mankind know how to give good gifts to their children, how much more if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit? Matthew's translation says, give good gifts to those who ask him. And sometimes when we talk about God being a good father, sometimes we find that a little bit difficult to take on board because for many of us, our experience of fatherhood hasn't been the best. It hasn't been God's intention for us. I, and in lots of ways, a, a good dad did lots of good things for us, but he was still broken. And so he fell short in a number of ways. And I've had to overcome that and not put my earthly experience of what a dad is like on my understanding of what God is like. You know, a few years ago, um, I used to do regularly a course for new believers, a Bible course for new believers. It was a really, really good, well-written course. But in one of the first ones, uh, it was all about the character and the nature of God and understanding who God was. And, uh, and one of the ways they uh, laid out the Bible course, which was really clever, was early on, they gave you, they asked you to write down your experience of your dad. And, uh, and so everyone, you give them a few minutes, they'd write down their experience of dad. And then it would go on and look at different things. And then later on, it would say, write down how you picture God. And then there'd be a moment that they said, OK, stop for a moment and look at what you've written about God and go back to what you've written about your earthly dad. And what was amazing was every time we did it, people had subconsciously put 
how they thought of their earthly dad on how they viewed God. And for many of us, I think we don't understand how good God is or how much God has for us or how willing he is to be there for us in our time of need because we've got a broken understanding of fatherhood. Found a few pictures that I'm going to put up now. Maybe they trigger something about your understanding or your experience of what a fatherhood has looked like. So if we look at the first one, this is something that I'm sure no parent can relate to during a lockdown. You're trying to work and you're not able, therefore, to give the attention that you'd want to to your kid. I wonder how many of us grew up with that kind of experience of parenting or fathering. If we move on to the next one. How many of us, when we grew up, our experience of parenting was more on the side of discipline than the unconditional love? And so we find it hard to confidently approach the throne of grace because we feel like we're going to be told off or the negative is going to be pointed out in our lives. Or the next one, maybe there was just no one there for us. There was a times, maybe critical moments, and it felt like we were all on our own. And you know, some of those emotional experiences, they, they go deep and they run deep in our hearts and in our lives. And as I say, subconsciously, they're still at work and they impact us at critical moments when maybe God's inviting us to come into his presence. For me, I've had to recognize that my experience of fathering has been broken and I need to forgive my dad for where he let me down, but also learn that my heavenly dad operates on a different basis. And for me, I've re replaced the, the broken picture I had with the truth relationship. And, and for me, there's, there's two stories that encompass that truth probably more clearly in the Gospels than I think any other. One is the story of the baptism of Jesus. And uh, if you know that story well, you know that Jesus stood in the River Jordan. So he stood in a flowing river. And as he stood in a flowing ri river, it's like he was being washed clean by the water. And then it says, heaven opened and the Holy Spirit came and descended on him. And a voice spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son. In you, I'm well pleased. And I've had moments that I've just uh, found some space and time, put on some worship music. And I've just stood there and I've closed my eyes. And I've pictured myself standing in a river of God's love. And I've pictured myself being cleansed. I've pictured my heart being renewed and washed and restored and healed. And then I've pictured the Holy Spirit coming and resting on me. And God filling me with his love. God filling me with his goodness. And then I've taken a moment just to hear God's voice speak over me. You're my beloved son. In you I'm well pleased. And I've listened to my heavenly father celebrating over me and rejoicing over me. And it's helped me catch on the inside something about God loves me, he's for me. He's with me. He wants me to be with him. And I've used that with the story of the baptism of Jesus. The other story I've used is the story of the prodigal son. Such a good story in Luke 15. But in Luke 15, if you know that well, there was a younger son and he totally messed up. So he asked his dad for his inheritance. He basically said to his dad, I wish you were dead. And what's quite incredible is the dad pays out his inheritance even though he's still alive. And the youngest son, he goes off. I was the youngest uh, brother of three. The youngest son, he goes off and he totally squanders it and ruins it. And he wastes all the money and he throws it away and he ends up feeding pigs, which in the culture of the day was the most unclean of the unclean. And he ends up filthy, dirty, stinking in a pigsty. And then he has this moment of, maybe I should go home. And I love the story because you get this stinky, disgusting, 
disappointing, failed child, rebellious child, who decides to head back to his dad. I have no idea what reception he was expecting, but in the story, it illustrates a reception I don't think any of us would have anticipated. As soon as his father sees him, he runs to him and he embraces him and he showers him with love and kissing and favour. He doesn't worry about the mud. He doesn't worry about the mistakes. He doesn't worry about telling him off. He receives him. He meets him first with love and grace and goodness. And it's only then that he says to his servants, quick, bring out some new garments. Let's get this stinky garments off him. Let's give him something new to, to wear. And then they have a great celebration and a party. And Jesus tells that story because he tells it that we might understand that's how our Heavenly Father feels about us. This morning, you might feel like you've not handled this last season at all well. You may feel like you've been a failure in so many ways. You may feel stinky. You may feel like you've let God down in, in a number of ways. Do you know your heavenly father is still running towards you? Do you know your heavenly father's not worried about the fact you're still wearing your garments of shame? Do you know your heavenly father is not keeping a distance from you? Do you know he's running towards you and he's wanting to wrap his arms around you? you. And Jesus says, if you're going to really know what it is like to commune with God, you've got to get first off that God is for you. And he's a loving father who's willing to run and wrap his arms around you because he wants to be with you and he wants to give you good gifts. And it reminds me of a verse in, in Romans chapter 8, which is lovely, lovely verse about meeting God as a father. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. If you're on the live chat, this isn't the moment to start putting your favourite songs from Mamma Mia down even though I'd always vote probably for the winner takes it all. But what Paul is saying is grab a hold of the fact that your heavenly father loves you, he's for you, he's brought you into his family and say to him, Abba, Father. And the word Abba, it was the, you, it was the word that was used for a little kid speaking to father. It was the word that she used for saying, Daddy, Daddy. And you know how little kids, they just trust that their dad unconditionally loves them, which is why they'll run to them. They just trust it because something on the inside just knows it. And what Paul is writing there is he's saying, when God's spirit comes on you, when you invite God's spirit onto you, something inside wakes up and you know that God is there and you're safe and you're secure and you're loved, and you can be one with him and know that goodness. And that changes absolutely everything. I have no idea what your experience is. I know no idea what your background and your history is. What I do know is true, though, is that God loves you. He's a good father, and he wants to be with you. Jesus only ever uses the phrase Abba Father once himself out of his own lips. And it's in Mark 14, his account, Mark's account of the story of uh, Gethsemane. And at Jesus' most pressing moment, it's the time that he needed to know most the unconditional love of his Father. Maybe today is a pressing moment for you. Maybe this season has been a pressing moment for you. In those times that we feel that we're being squeezed to the point of breaking, know that your good father is there. He's with you. He's running towards you. He's wanting to wrap his arms of love around you. And he's wanting to make you one with him. We're going to respond to God now. 
Mickey and Haley have come back. We're going to sing in a moment. Run to the Father. The truth is, the best thing we can ever do is make a choice to turn our eyes and our hearts to our Heavenly Father and know that as we make that choice, so he runs to us and wraps his arms around us. Let's just take a moment to pray and maybe to reflect on what I've been sharing. I just want to say this is a safe place. Wherever God is, it's a safe place. God's presence is here. God's spirit is here. So we're safe. The sense I have is that for some of us, it's like we've been bottling things up because we've not known whether we can cope. And I feel like in these moments, the Lord's just wanting to say, you can let it go. I'm here. I'm good. I'm with you. Maybe this morning you're in grief. Maybe the loss of Frida has hit you deep. Maybe you're in grief because of the loss of Frida. Maybe you're in grief because of other things and the loss of Frida has triggered something. Maybe you've got other stuff going on at the moment. Maybe you felt just pushed to the very edge. Let's just open that right now in the presence of God. And let's invite his spirit to come. Let's invite God to come and draw near and love on us. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are with us. Thank you that you're closer than the closest friend. Thank you you're more for us than the best picture of our Father even enables us to grab hold of. And Lord, I pray for every person tuning in this morning. Lord, I pray that they will know you running towards them right now scooping them up in your arms and pouring your love and your goodness across their lives, across all of our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, we're going to pick up on our worship now, but let's not interrupt the flow of the Spirit of God. Let's keep, invi let's keep inviting God's Spirit to come and let's let our Father love on us and do whatever he's wanting to do in our lives as we run to him and know him running to us.